good to see everyone here in church tonight. We'll begin the service in Psalm 79. Psalm 79. O God, the heathen are come into thine inheritance. Thy holy temple have they defiled. They have laid Jerusalem on heaps. The dead bodies of thy servants have they given to be meat unto the fowls of the heaven, the flesh of thy saints unto the beasts of the earth. Their blood have they shed like water round about Jerusalem, and there was none to bury them. We are become a reproach to our neighbors, a scorn and derision to them that are round about us. How long, Lord, wilt thou be angry forever? Shall thy jealousy burn like fire? Pour out thy wrath upon the heathen that have not known thee, and upon the kingdoms that have not called upon thy name. For they have devoured Jacob and laid waste his dwelling place. O remember not against us former iniquities. Let thy tender mercies speedily prevent us, for we are brought very low. Help us, O God of our salvation, to the glory of thy name, and deliver us and purge away our sins for thy name's sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is their God? Let him be known among the heathen in our sight by the revenging of the blood of thy servants, which is shed. Let the sighing of the prisoner come before thee. According to the greatness of thy power, preserve thou those that are appointed to die, and render unto our neighbors sevenfold into their bosom their reproach, wherewith they have reproached thee, O Lord. So we thy people and sheep of thy pasture will give thee thanks forever. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. Let's pray. Lord, tonight as we gather here in your house, we thank you for the joy and pleasure that comes to us as we gather in your name, as we gather with your people, and especially as we gather in your presence. We thank you, Lord, that we are promised your presence. We ask that it would be felt tonight. And as we enjoy the presence of God, I pray that you would make us especially mindful of who you are, of your greatness, of your holiness, of your power and might. We pray that we would glory in these things and rejoice because you alone are worthy of our worship and praise. And so we pray that we would give it to you, that we would give it with our whole heart, that we would give it in the songs that we sing, that we would give it as we pray to you. We pray that we would rejoice in you and in your word tonight, that we would hang on your words as if our very life depends on it, because, Lord, your word are, is the very word of life. I pray that we would believe that and that as we listen to the preaching, we would desire to be fed, to be enlivened by the truth of your word. And we ask, Lord, that you do all these things for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Number 65 in the hymnal, please. Number 65. It is a familiar hymn, but an alternate tune. So we're going to ask the piano player to play through the first verse of Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Number 65. You can remain seated as you listen. together please and we'll sing number 65 guide me O thou great Jehovah guide me O thou great Jehovah Amen. 
But turn then over to number 278, 278, <clears throat> we'll sing, lead me on to higher ground, number 78, 278, sorry. I'm pressing on the upward way. To 484, 484. I'll ask you to join me in standing one more time as we sing. He leadeth me, O blessed thought, O words with heavenly comfort fraught. He leadeth me. 484. He leadeth me. Oh, 
Amen. We're in Judges chapter 7 tonight. Judges chapter 7. Let's read the first seven verses of the chapter. We'll preach the whole chapter to you. And the message tonight is God brings deliverance. The story of Gideon as we continue through that. Judges chapter 7, beginning in verse 1. Will you stand with me as we read the passage together? Judges 7, we'll read down through verse 7. These are the words of God. Then Jerubbaal, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him, rose up early and pitched beside the well of Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. Now therefore go to, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned of the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people are yet too many. Bring them down unto the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, This shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And of whomsoever I say unto thee, This shall not go with thee, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people under the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink. And the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their t- mouth, were three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand, and let all the other people go, every man unto his place. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word tonight, may we be thankful, first of all, that you've taken the time to tell us your, the history of your dealings with man, but also to tell us stories that teach us, that teach us about you. Help us, Lord, that we, we would be more interested in you than we are in Gideon and his 300 and the men that lapped. I pray that we would be thinking of you and trying to understand you and what this says about you because you're the most important. You are the key. You are the point. I pray that we would see that tonight, that we would love you more because of what we hear, that we would serve you better, that we would desire to to do your work and do it your way and live holy as we ought to. And I pray that you'd do these things for your own namesake, that your glory would be shown in this world through us and our lives. Please help me as I preach, Lord. I pray that my message would be helpful to us, that it would be clear that we would understand what, what your word is saying and that we would understand how it applies to us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Our culture is obsessed with image. Our technologies, of course, feed that obsession. They, they don't make it better. One of our most popular social networks is called Facebook. How about image right there? And who could have a Facebook page without a profile picture? And then, of course, we get really fancy with our pictures and what we want people to see. Most people don't wake up after a hard night of sleep, snap a picture, and put that up as their profile picture on Facebook. Typically, people do their hair. Typically. I'm I'm not saying universally, but most of the time. The rich and famous have learned the art of branding their image, and they do it for profit, and it becomes very profitable to them. Do we, in this modern age, in a first world country, With all of our enlightenment, do we worship graven images? Well, maybe we don't bow down before carved stones or tree stumps like the pagans did in third world countries, but we most certainly worship images. We do it first world style. Our images aren't built of tree trunks and rocks. They're made of pixels, carefully photoshopped and airbrushed, 
to erase any imperfections. But our preferred image, the one we worship with the most devotion and steadfastness, is our own image. We worship that first. We carefully craft that image. We project it online. As the man said, I only wish I were as great as I make myself look on Facebook. (laughs) The camera is the image maker. Add a selfie stick, and you have your own handy idol maker right there in your hand. When Andre Agassi, Agassi, the tennis player, sold Canon cameras, maybe you don't even remember that there were Canon cameras at one time, the motto was, image is everything. If you Google image is everything, you'll find an impressive list of articles in support of that notion. A December 2011 Business Insider article offers nine reasons why Your image is everything. It begins with this grabber. Branding matters, and that rings true for both companies and individuals. In August, a 2015 article in Psychology Today explains why image is everything. Recent research reveals that image and emotion beat fact and logic. The article asks, have you ever wondered why Ads feature beautiful models, adorable puppies, cute babies, and hilarious gags. Recent research reveals we make brand purchase decisions based on the associations and feelings as opposed to the facts and stats. To sell a product, advertisers create an image that you will want to associate with. Beautiful women sell shampoo. Macho guys sell pickup trucks, and funny people, sometimes even lizards, sell car insurance. (laughs) Advertisement sells image, and image sells products, and advertisers know which images sell and which images don't. Now, Dale Davis explains that this is why we struggle in this modern age, we struggle so much to understand the Bible. The Bible, he said, is not obsessed as we are with our image. In fact, the Bible frequently cuts cross-grained to this whole mentality. As a case in point, Judges 7 begins the, the, the tale, the story of Gideon's amazing victory over the Midianites, begins with this classic line, one for the ages. Then Jerubal, who was Gideon. That's not one probably that you memorized when you were in Sunday school class. When you think of the story of Gideon, you might not even remember that he was called Jerubal, but here in Judges chapter 7, the very first verse, the very first opening line, the grabber of the story, says, Then Jerubal, who was Gideon. Now, Gideon's father called him Jerry Baal after he pulled down the altar of Baal. That night, Gideon ruined his image. Now, of course, we could mean that a variety of different ways. He ruined the image of Baal, for sure, but Gideon also ruined his own image, at least with the men of Ophir. They demanded that Joash bring him out that he may die. It wasn't a banner night for Gideon. He lost the respect of the Abbe Ezraites. Apparently, he also lost the respect of many modern-day Christians that night as well. Daniel Block, who's written one of the better commentaries on the book of Judges recent, in recent days, explains that Gideon is called Jerubal as the reluctant warrior who manipulates God. That doesn't sound like a high view of Gideon to me. Maybe Gideon needed a PR firm to help with his image a little bit. No doubt his handlers would have told him that the midnight raid on Baal, not going to play well in the press. Do it in the daytime. You know, and forget about the fleece. You know, history will frown on it. Christians won't like it later on. Uh, That's the way we think today. 
How is this going to look? But Gideon wasn't concerned with image. He was concerned with doing what God said. I don't think that the point in opening Judges 7 with that little grabber is to tell you that Gideon is a reluctant warrior who manipulates God. I think God is the one inspiring this. I don't just think it, I know it. I think God inspired it, and I don't think he means it as a slur against Gideon at all. I think God uses the name Jeribel to point to one shining moment in Gideon's life. Nobody threw a parade for Gideon when he tore down the altar of Baal. But God honors it. The name Jerubal means let Baal plead. It's, it's an ironic name. It's a sarcastic name. And Joash said unto all that stood against him, Will ye plead for Baal? Will ye save him? He that will plead for him, let him be put to death whilst it is yet morning. If he be a god, let him plead for himself, because one hath cast down his altar. Therefore on that day he called him Jerubal, saying, Let Baal plead against him, because he hath thrown down his altar. The man who pulls down idols, who casts down imaginations and high things that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God, that is the man God uses right there. A man who's reluctant, unwilling to throw down the idols is a man who will never get past first base in serving God. These idols might be material or immaterial. They might include people or pixels, images or ambitions, anything, really, anything that displaces God's priority in your life, his preeminence in your life. Our hearts are idol factories. Even good things may become an idol to us. Before any Christian can expect to be used of God, he must pull down his own idols, not just knock down his neighbors, but pull down his own. And that is exactly what Jerubal, who is Gideon, did. Now, God doesn't see things the way we do. He doesn't see things with our modern eyes, for sure. He doesn't see things with ancient eyes either. He see th sees things with infinite, eternal, omniscient eyes. We want our heroes always to be tall, dark, and godly. We want charisma. We want mega personalities. We love our mega churches, our cult leaders, our celebrity pastors. In his powerful book, No Place for Truth, David Wells offers this stinging rebuke of modern ministry. He said professional demeanor weighs more heavily than does theological ability. When churches are considering a candidate to fill their pulpit, they're more impressed with the polish on the shoes than they are with the careful examination of Scripture, the careful application of it. And that has become a plague to us in our day. So it is that the church in our day has come to share the values of the world. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and base things of the world and things which are despised hath God chosen, yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Gideon confuses us. A lot of these judges confuse us, don't they? I mean, we look at Barak and we're not sure. Was he a man? Was he not a man? Right? We look at Shamgar. Who is this Shamgar guy? We look at Ehud, you know, and he uses treachery in order to rip the bowels out of Eglon. And we look at Jephthah and he sacrificed his daughter. We look at Samson and he's a bad guy. And we're not sure what we're supposed to think. And we wouldn't vote any of these guys to be our pastor for sure. And what we see in Scripture is that God has put his hand on some unlikely heroes. The world 
would never call them heroes. But I think that's the point. God chooses the things that man despises. And so we see Jeroboam, who is Gideon, gathered with his army at the, wall, at the well of Herod. The name Herod means trembling appropriately, and that's exactly what went on there, a whole lot of trembling. Gideon was trembling, and so were apparently two-thirds of his army. When Gideon invited all those who were fearful to return and depart from Mount Gilead, 22,000 out of 32,000 packed up and went home right away. Thank you very much. <laughs> How's that for inspiring leadership? You know, I mean, there are some guys, right? Some coaches you hear guys would just run through a wall for that coach. Gideon apparently was not that guy right there. <laughs> they weren't clamoring to follow him into battle. Remember, the narrator, who I think was Samuel, has a point to make in every story, and he has a point to make in this one, in the way he's presenting the truth here. I think I can guess at the point of Gideon's story. The point is that it's not Gideon who brings deliverance. It is God who brings deliverance. Gideon said, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. An entire chapter in the story of Gideon is dedicated to showing us the several ways that God reassured Gideon. Let him know that I am with you. And still, Gideon was afraid. Do you think God is making a point here to us? God didn't go to such lengths into, in order to reassure any of the other judges in the book of Judges. Nor did God require that any other army be stripped down to such a small number. Now think about this. God is reassuring Gideon, and yet Gideon very fearful. All the reassurances, still he needs more. And then God is stripping his army down. This is what God did with Gideon. Why? The Bible tells us why God stripped Gideon's army down to 300. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand hath saved me. God knows his people. He knows our tendency to take the glory. We would be tempted to look at Gideon and think, Humble man, humble, humble man, weak, but humble. But then we associate humility and weakness, don't we? And so we would never think that Gideon would let success get to his hand, head. And yet we see otherwise when we go further into his story. Now, modern Christianity needs this message. Our salvation, our deliverance, our success, and our blessing does not come from our might. We don't need big personalities or big churches or big numbers to accomplish God's work. What we need, really, scared, timid, trembling Christians who will risk everything for Christ's sake. That's the message, I think, of Judges 7. I plan to preach that message to you in the time that I have left. May God persuade us to take our eyes off the so-called leaders of our movement, the men we look to to carry us out of obscure darkness. And may we turn our eyes to the man, Christ Jesus. He's the hero. Jesus is the hero. He's the one we look to. And may we look to him and be saved. Judges 7 focuses on three main events. First, God reduced Gideon's army to the size he wanted it to be. Then, God reassured Gideon through a Midianite vision. And finally, God gave Gideon and his men the victory. I want to make three points then from these main events. And the three points, the first of these three points is this. That God alone brings deliverance. God alone brings deliverance. In chapter 6, God went to great lengths to reassure Gideon 
In this chapter, God goes to great lengths to whittle down Gideon's army to the right size. Evidently, God wanted Gideon to know for sure that deliverance would not come through his valor. God called him a mighty man of valor, but God wanted him to know that it would not be his valor that would take the day. This is a major point with Gideon. God didn't make a big deal out of this kind of thing with any other judge except for him. If we look at Judges 8, we have a hint as to why. Gideon didn't handle success very well. God looks on the heart. God knows the men that he calls. He knows their weakness. He knows their pitfalls. But we shouldn't think that Gideon is unique in his tendency to let success go to his head. I mean, I don't know anyone else like that. Probably nobody who's alive today, not since Gideon, that has that same problem. But anyone who succeeds will be tempted to be haughty, to be exalted, to vaunt themselves against God, to think of themselves more highly than what they ought to think. It's a mark of our fallenness that we're much better at failure than we are at success. The Bible tells the sad story of King Uzziah, who was truly a great king, but his life ended in a tragic way. He showed a lot of wisdom and foresight when he was ruling in Israel. He provided for the protection of his people. The Bible describes it in 2 Chronicles 26. And he made in Jerusalem engines invented by cunning men to be on the towers and upon the bulwarks, to shoot arrows and great stones withal. And his name spread far abroad, for he was marvelously helped till he was strong. But when he was strong, his heart was lifted up to his destruction. For he transgressed against the Lord his God and went into the temple of the Lord to burn incense upon the altar of incense. I wish it weren't this way. I wish that it were possible for Christians to experience uninhibited blessing and success without ever growing cold or distant from God or forgetting God or thinking that their might, their power, the might of their own hands had done this for them. I wish that that were possible, but it isn't. We could pray to learn what the Apostle Paul said, both how to be abased and how to abound. We need this lesson. We need it early and often. But the harder lesson for the Christian is to learn how to abound, not to learn how to be abased. God especially chose to teach this to Gideon. At first, God cut Gideon's army by following his own word, by having Gideon do what God had commanded to be done in the law. God commanded in Deuteronomy 20 and verse 8 that those who were afraid would be permitted to leave battle. And the officers shall speak further unto the people, and they shall say, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted? Let him go and return unto his house, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. Fear, of course, is contagious. It's as contagious as COVID-19. <laughs> so God upheld his own commandment. The number of fearful soldiers far outnumbered the number of fearless soldiers. I can't say what that means, if it means that Israel was cowardly or the Midianites were running quite the bluff against Israel, I can't say. The second way that God reduced Israel's army was by a test. And here we come to the fun part, because this is the part we preachers all like to spiritualize. And we come with all kinds of creative applications to, to this particular test. Did God use this test to show vigilance or some other virtue? You know, we really can't say. If God did, in fact, choose the 300 most vigilant, it would, first of all, seem to contradict the spirit of this passage. I have a hard time saying that since God is purposely demonstrating that men are not delivered by their own valor or their own strength, 
that God then went and chose the 300 most valiant right there. That would seem to go against the point of this story. Besides that, when, it, when the Israelite army, the, the what, 10,000 that were left, when they went to the watering hole to get their water, I, I really don't think all 10,000 were getting their drink at one time, you know? So I think there were plenty to stand guard. And besides that, the army of Midian, according to the beginning of the chapter, was uh, about four miles away. You know, they didn't have quick launch capabilities in that day. Today, four miles is nothing. But when soldiers are on foot, four miles is plenty of time for you to get a drink of water without worrying about how vigilant you are. Besides that, when an army of 300 goes up against an army that can't be counted, what would be the point of choosing the 300 most battle-ready? Why that? It's like saying, you know, the Polish army picked up the best rocks to throw at the German tanks. <laughs> you know, I'm sure they were great rocks and all, but you're still throwing them at tanks. When Jesus fed the 5,000, he didn't pack out the five best loaves. The point is not the quality of the loaves. The point is the power of Jesus Christ. And here, the point is not the quality of the soldiers, but the strength of God perfected in the weakness, the obvious weakness of Gideon's army. Now, we don't know why God chose this test or what he intended to prove by it, or even that he was making a point with this test. Apparently, he didn't want us to know his reasons for this test, or he would have told us why he chose this particular test, but he doesn't tell us. So anyone who tells you this is why God had, this is why God chose that 300, they're making it up, okay? You can listen, and you can nod, and you can smile, and get what you can out of it, but they're making it up because God doesn't tell us why. He could just as well have used this way of cutting Gideon's army down to 300 because it would be easy to tell who drank with their hands, you know? I'll bet the other guys came up with wet hair. That's what I'm thinking. So you could go through and say, you, 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 and you, the ones with the dry head. The soldiers, of course, had no idea about the water hole test. They didn't know that they were being tested. Gideon knew it. But that also made the test effective because you know how you are when you know you're being tested. I'm going to watch you take this drink, all right? I'm going to watch how you do it. And I'm only choosing the ones who drink right. And they're thinking, man, what was the training on that? How'd that training go? I don't remember that in the training anywhere. No one was trying to guess which way they should drink the water. And apparently, not many men drank water that way at the watering hole, at least not at that time. Now, it's ruined drinking at water holes for me from now on. From that point forward, when I learned the story of Gideon, never again could I just dunk my head in the water because I had to be vigilant like the 300. And so when I come to the watering hole, I, I go down on one knee and I stick a hand in there and pull it up, and it all comes out. I just lick the wet off my hand because that's the only way I can figure out how to drink from it. Never works real well when you try to do that in real life, does it? You just have to splash it up in your face. I don't know what you're doing with that. We should not think that there's any particular virtue in lapping water out of your hand. And that's not the point of this story. God highlighted the weakness of these 300 rather than highlighting their strength. That's the point here. The point is not that mighty men drink out of their hand. That's not the point at all. The second thing I want to show you here is that God brings deliverance assuredly. God alone brings deliverance, and that's what God was showing in whittling his army down. But then God brings deliverance Assuredly, certainly. Before God sent Gideon to battle, he gave him an opportunity for yet one more assurance. All the assurances that were given in chapter 6 were not enough. Gideon needed more, and God knew it. Notice the seventh verse. God promised Gideon, by the 300 men that lapped, will I save you? 
That's a promise. And yet God knew that Gideon wasn't quite ready to lead Israel into battle. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Arise, get thee down unto the host, for I have delivered it into thine hand. But if thou fear to go down, go thou with Phura thy servant down to the host. And God had it all set up. A Midianite dreamed a dream and shared it with his friend. Without any prompting, his friend heard the dream and he said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel, for into his hand have God delivered Midian and all the host. Now, I have no idea how this man's friend knew that. I read the same account of the dream as you do, and I can't make that connection when I look at it. I don't know what he knew that we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. We could parse the Hebrew, and we still wouldn't know. The Bible doesn't offer us a clue about how this man knew the interpretation of the dream. God set up this whole elaborate conversation for Gideon's sake to strengthen his hand. Now, there's a part of me that wants to say, Gideon, that's silly. When God Almighty tells you, I've delivered them into your hand, the 300 Midianites, the, I'm sorry, the 300 soldiers in your army will be all that you need. Shouldn't that be enough? How could a lame dream in a Midianite tent and a strange interpretation of it give more assurance than what God said, and yet it did? Does it show the weakness of Gideon? Perhaps, but that seems to be the theme here in this chapter. Think about, though, what Gideon had to go through to get this assurance. Because he had to pass by all the hosts of the Midianites, which the Bible says lay along in the valley like grasshoppers for multitude. And their camels were without number as the sand by the seaside for multitude. Everywhere Gideon looked... He was reminded of his own weakness. I don't think Gideon was looking at this thing and saying, man, I'm weak. I think he was saying, man, I am weak. He was weak. Everywhere he looked, he saw his weakness. But I think never more than in the conversation he overheard in the tents of Midian. Because as Gideon passed by a random tent in the camp of the Midianites, God prompted a heathen Midianite to relate the dream that he had had that night. Obviously, God himself orchestrated this entire episode. And that poor, hapless Midianite and his friend unwittingly aided and abetted the enemy. The Midianite dreamed of a cake of barley bread. It was not exactly a vision of sugar plums that danced in his head. Now, I don't know about any of you but I have never had a dream about sugar plums, never had a vision about sugar plums, to be honest. Now, after we're done, you're going to tell me what a sugar plum is, all right? But I don't know what a sugar plum is. If I saw one, if I ran into a branch full of sugar plums, I wouldn't know that it was sugar plums. If you fed them to me, I probably wouldn't eat them because I don't eat things like that. I just don't. If I don't know what it is, I'm not, I'm not an adventure eater, all right? But I'm just saying I've never in my life had a vision of sugar plums. I don't dream about plums. I dream about Little Debbie cakes, <laughs> root beer floats, apple pie. I dream about apple pie. But the Midianite dreamed about a cake of barley bread. It wasn't, by the way, kids, it wasn't a cake with frosting, all right? It wasn't that kind of cake like you would have for your birthday. It wasn't birthday cake, it was barley cake. Barley bread was the poor man's loaf. It was eaten mainly in times of famine when that was all that was left. It was kind of like, you know, you've got the boxes of crackers down in your, in your pantry, you know? They're saved in case there's ever a famine. So you can pull them out and then you're gonna eat them, you know? It's that kind of thing. Now, I imagine Israel was eating a lot of it after seven years of Midianite raids. It was the most despised loaf a man could eat, like gluten-free bread 
Think of it that way. Like that flatbread stuff they sell at Subway to give you the illusion of a healthy choice. <laughs> the entire dream is ironic. These Midianites must have taken part in quite a few raiding parties. They must have known that Israel was eating a lot of barley bread at that time. God chose the most despised loaf a man could eat and made it represent Gideon. How's that for pumping up a man's ego? God reminded Gideon again that he chooses the weak things, the despised things, the things that are not to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God offered Gideon a reassurance, but he gave him um, an ego booster of sorts, an ego deflator. Now, some commentators think that the Midianites who interpreted the dream, um, the Midianite who interpreted this dream was mocking Gideon, and that may be the case. I can't say. If he was mocking, the joke was on him because his interpretation actually encouraged Gideon. Now, maybe he was serious. Maybe he did know Gideon's name. Maybe both men knew Gideon. Still, his prophecy strengthened Gideon's heart. And the point is, that God used this dream to reassure Gideon God would deliver the Midianites into his hand against all odds, regardless of how small and weak your army is and how small and weak you are and how despised you are. Those Midianites are toast. Pun intended. (laughs) Barley toast. (laughs) Notice what Gideon did here then in verse 15. He didn't tweet out a, you know, a brash tw- tweet. <laughs> he didn't do a victory dance or strut his stuff before the armies of Israel. The Bible says that he worshiped and returned into the host of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord hath delivered into your hand the host of Midian. God infused Gideon with confidence so that he could inspire these 300 men to go and fight. And that brings us to the third point. And that is this, that God brings deliverance absolutely. It's not a partial victory. It's not a, you know, a moral victory, as they like to say. It was an absolute victory. One thing we need to know about the battle, Gideon's army in this battle played a supporting role. They were not the champions. They were not the victors. They were the support staff. They didn't win the victory. They were accessories to the victory. Yet God worked through them and used them. They were necessary to that victory. Their preparations for battle were absurd. There's really no other way to say it. It was absurd the way they prepared. Gideon told them to arm themselves with a trumpet, an empty pitcher, and a lamp. All right, now, I've never heard of those weapons of war aside from Gideon. I don't think NATO even uses them. They probably haven't heard of them, or they would be. The UN might be moving to these, but Gideon confronted the Midianite horde with 300 men armed with trumpets, empty pitchers, and lamps. There is, of course, no, limit, lim, no limitations on the amount of spiritualizing that we can do with that particular truth. But this is what God really did with Gideon's 300. We can spiritualize it all we want, but it's not a spiritual truth. It's a historical fact. Gideon's 300 took on the army of the Midianites that was without number, and they went armed for battle with a trumpet, an empty pitcher, and a lamp. That was it. God has peppered this deliverance with all sorts of absurdities. He whittled the army to 300. He used a strange test to reach that number. He used a strange vision to encourage Gideon. And now he sends out his army with a sight and sound experience. That's what it was. We're going to have a light show and we're going to have some breaking lamps 
and blowing trumpets. And I'm thinking that when they blew the trumpets, that it did not sound like anything you might hear at a Bravino Hall. Well, maybe when they're doing their warm-ups, things like that. The, the Boston Symphony probably was not what they were playing at that time. Strange and unconventional, to put it mildly, but that's the way God works. Strange and unconventional. Not necessarily through the absurd, but definitely through those things that are not. God does what we wouldn't have expected. God doesn't try to live up to our expectations. He does this because God doesn't need anything that you and I have to offer. All your talents, God doesn't need them. It's good that you use them for God, but he doesn't need them. He's not looking down, scouring the earth, saying, I need another Apostle Paul. Because he doesn't. God doesn't. He doesn't need our buildings. He doesn't need our sermons. He doesn't need our organization. He doesn't need our manpower. He doesn't need our people skills. He doesn't need our gimmicks. He doesn't need our programs. He doesn't need our structure. He doesn't need anything that you and I have to offer him. And occasionally, once in a while, God sets out to show us that, just to be clear. And so what do we see of Gideon's 300? They did what they were told to do. That's it. They didn't stand around saying, what? He wants to, what? Can you picture, you know, all the guys at the water cooler, where you work, and the boss says, this is how we're going to do it. All right, we're going to have a big, you know, company-wide uh, more, moral, morale building, you know, exercise here. We're going to go paintballing, and here's how we're going to do it. We're not going to take paintball guns. We're going to take a trumpet, an empty pitcher, and a lamp. And all your coworkers are going, what? Is he nuts? Has he lost his mind? And you know how it goes, right? They all stand around and, and talk about this thing. This is crazy. Why are we doing this this way? Not Gideon's army. God said, this is what you're going to do. They didn't say, no, no why? Why the trumpet? Oh, why, why the pitcher? Why break the pitcher? Why the lamp? What is the point? God said, this is what you're going to do. Gideon instructed his army, and they did it. That's it. At the darkest hour of the night, midnight, they blew their trumpets, they broke their pitchers, and they shouted the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Pardon me. The watch, which was newly set in the camp of the Midianites, responded in terror, and that terror quickly spread throughout the camp. And then Gideon's army stood still. While God turned every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. Gideon's army shouted what Daniel Block has called a magnificent irony. They said the sword of the Lord and of Gideon, and no one in that army had a sword. Nobody. Gideon didn't have a sword. As it turns out, the only swords were the ones in the enemy's hands, and they were used against each other. So the sword of the Lord and of Gideon was actually the sword held by the Midianite soldiers who used it to kill the Midianites. The host of Midian fled in terror, and Israel pursued. The 21st verse describes an, uh, really an anti-Julius Caesar, like the opposite of Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar famously said, you know, if you use the classical Greek, uh, Latin, weeny weedy weeky, but it looks to me like vini vidi viki. I came, I saw, I conquered. The Bible describes the Midianites saying they ran, they cried, they fled. <clears throat> Daniel Block again, this is the natural response of those who have been awakened from the deepest of sleep at midnight to the sound of horns blowing, jars smashing, people shouting, and the sight of 300 blazing torches around the camp. This is psychological warfare at its best. And then the Ephraimites stood at the fords of Beth Bara and Jordan and killed those who tried to pass over, including Oreb and Zeb two of the princes of the Midianites, and that is the end of the story. 
That's it. Or I should say this, the end of this chapter of the story, because there's another chapter to come. So a couple of lessons here and we're finished. Number one, before God uses us, he will first strip us of our reliance on everything else and force us to rely on him alone. Too often we rely on superficial things, size, clout, influence, connections, training, know-how, talent, skill. We rely on those things. God insists that we rely on Him and Him alone. And if He intends to use us, He whittles away all the other things that we tend to rely on instead of relying on God. That's the first thing. This is the way God operates. Number two, God doesn't need what we have to offer. I said that already, but let me say it again. Because it's good for us to be reminded of this. What could we offer God that he could possibly need? What do you have that hasn't been given to you? If the modern church has forgotten this lesson, we think that, you know, a bigger church can accomplish more of God's purpose. I hope we'll see our mistake in that. We think that, you know, better facilities, gifted leaders, polished programs, of course, today, contemporary music and spectacular light shows and fog machines, or any number of other things are what God needs to accomplish his purpose. Now, don't get me wrong. Most certainly, God can use our facilities, our leaders, our programs, our talents, our numbers. But if we depend on those things instead of depending on God, we're doomed. We're doomed. The things that we accomplish will not be for God. They'll be for us. We must simply make ourselves available to God, along with every talent, every gift, everything that we possess, and say, it's all yours, God, but when we depend on our experience or on our talent or on our education or on our organization or on our people skills or anything else, then we can expect God to do something in order to reduce us in size, to reduce us in our own opinion. And then the last thing, the last lesson, I think, from Gideon here is this, that God does not value what you and I value. God doesn't value what men value. By the way, by God's grace, as we live our lives more and more in submission to him, that will change. But God will never change to value what we value. He will teach us to value what he does. And it's important for us to get that in a story like this. In our fundamentalist tradition, we have valued image as much as the world does. We really have. We have our big shot preachers, and that's what we're into these days. We've depended on that to bring about change in the world. We've depended on programs. We've depended on talent and not on God. There's only one image that can change the world. It's not yours and it's not mine. The one Paul refers to as the image of the invisible God, that is the image that will change the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. 
When we come to God through Christ, when we rejoice in God by seeing and delighting in our Lord Jesus Christ, that is what changes the world. Not our delight, but the one we delight in. Our Lord Jesus Christ. Look to Him. Depend on Him. For whatever you have to do, you may feel overwhelmed with what you're called to do, what you're asked to do. But listen, God is able. He is able. Depend on Him and see what He'll do. Let's pray. We thank You, Lord, for the encouragement we received from the story of Gideon. A great victory that You won with a weak man leading a tiny army, outnumbered, outranked, uh, outmuscled, but they did what you said, and you used them, and you won a victory, and you can do that still. This is the way you work. I pray that we would believe that. I pray that you would deliver us from all of our conceits about ourselves, all of our arrogant pride. I pray that we would lay it on the altar before you, and that we would turn to you and depend on you and realize that we have no hope except for you. And I pray then, Lord, that we would proclaim your glory in the world around us, that we would preach your gospel and see what you can do with it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with me. Keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. I'd ask you, please, not to be looking around during this time, but to use this for a careful self-examination. And if there are decisions that need to be made, I want you to make those decisions right now. If there are things that the Lord is dealing with you about, please, please respond to him as you should. If you need to come to the front, please do that. Make, it, make the, the decision serious here. But respond to what God has said to you. As the invitation song is played, if you need to come, please do so now. Thank you, Lord, for the message that we've heard tonight. We thank you especially that you take the time in these stories to set before us important truths that we need to understand. We thank you that we can understand these things and that in understanding them, we are encouraged and strengthened for the work that we have to do. It's especially encouraging to us, Lord, to know that you don't need our talent, that you don't need us to be especially skilled or gifted, that you don't need us to be big or successful, that you work through your people your way. I pray that you would use us according to your will and that we would simply obey you and do what you've said to do. Please help us through this week that we would be especially mindful of this important truth. I pray that we would Take the time every day. Protect the time that we've set aside for our walk with you. And I pray that we would enjoy a close walk. 
And I pray that you would bless us as your people. Watch over us. Watch over those who are away from us right now. Bring them back to us safely. And help us to be able to continually rejoice in you and your goodness and your mighty work on our behalf. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>